The Lord be with you. And also with you. We welcome you to worship on this fifth weekend in Easter. As we gather this evening, may we always desire to remain connected to our Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask everyone to fill out the cards there in your pews, and after the service, you can leave them in the plates at the offering, uh, offering plates at the entrances to the church. Before we do anything else, let's take a moment to greet the folks around you. Uh, just one reminder that uh, Monday is the last day to receive those uh, pastoral nomination forms for our call committee, the opportunity to nominate a pastor that you think might be a good fit to be called here to our Savior. Uh, we're collecting those names, and then we will send those names off to the district as they compile their call list for our congregation. The forms are available on the table next to the church office, and again, Monday is the last day to get those forms in. Our service today is Divine Service Setting 1, printed in your bulletin or beginning on page 151 in our hymnals. We now begin with our opening hymn, hymn 915. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. 
Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our intro it from Psalm 145. A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A little while, and you will see me no longer, and again a little while, and you will see me. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, you make the minds of your faithful to be of one will. Grant that we may love what you have commanded and desire what you promise, that among the many changes of this world, our hearts may be fixed where true joys are found through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Our first reading for this day comes from the book of Acts in chapter 8. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water... The Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went away on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading comes from the first letter of John in chapter 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, 
If God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. And we rise to sing our response. The Holy Gospel, which serves as the basis for the sermon, is written in the 15th chapter of St. John, beginning at the first verse. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, He it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We now confess the Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The hymn of the day is hymn 540. You may be seated.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. I invite you to open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 15. In the Pew Bible, this is on page 1071. And to start, I'll read a portion again of our Lord's words in verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. And let us pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, in holy baptism, you generated spiritual life in us and connected us to Christ and made us your own dear children. Throughout our lives, you continue to feed and nourish us in the faith so that we may grow strong and fruitful in our lives for the sake of Christ. Defend and preserve and protect us, we pray, from becoming dead to you and thus worthy of only being cast into the fire. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. About four or five weeks ago, I was out in the backyard eyeing my apple trees uh, because I knew that eventually the blossoms are going to start coming out and there were some dead branches. So I get the saw out and start cutting down dead branches and cutting them up and putting them in a pile so that this summer I, when we start a campfire somewhere, I can just burn those branches up. And I never gave it a second thought, really, until I prepared for this text in John 15. And then suddenly I realized that what I was not taking all that seriously or giving even a second thought to regarding wood from a tree, our Lord takes deadly seriously when it comes to those branches that are supposed to be connected to Christ and alive and growing, and they are not. And so Jesus here in chapter 15 starts out with this analogy, I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. And so in using the images of a, a grape vine and its branches that come off of it, and the one who tends to or cares for the vine, he is beginning to, to bring a word picture into our minds of how the relationship of those who are in Christ should be, and if it is not, what the potential consequences of that are. And so verse 2 Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. And again, using this very common earthly uh, imagery here, it's only natural that a dead limb has to be cut away, and that even limbs that are producing, branches that are producing uh, fruit, may have suckers or other things growing off of them that would hinder the growth of that fruit, and so that has to be pruned. And in the Greek, the word for pruning can also mean to clean or to cleanse. And so every branch in me that does not bear fruit, well, he takes away. And the ones that do bear fruit goes through a cleansing or a, a pruning process in our lives to strip away those things that would drain uh, away the energy that we have in our connection to Christ so that we can then have lives that demonstrate more and more the presence of Christ and his work in us. And so if, uh, if that word for prunes also can mean cleanse, then that is what makes the next verse uh, make sense. Verse 3, already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. And so in regard to his disciples, they had been brought here now into a saving faith in Christ. They didn't totally fully understand him yet, and they wouldn't until after the resurrection and the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit would, would bring it all to clear, clarity. But, but they did know, as Peter confessed of Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so they were in a living relationship connection by faith with Jesus and so they are already clean because of that word he had spoken to them and remember it is through the word that God acts because wherever the holy scriptures are there the holy spirit is and there will be really one of two uh, consequences I guess or outcomes the word of the law which will bring condemnation the word of the gospel that brings forgiveness. Both are necessary, and God uses both uh, for 
people. Uh, even the Christian now, again, now and again needs to hear the law. You're getting off track. Repent. Turn away. Watch out. You may die if you continue in this fashion. And when we recognize where we have gone astray, then he comes to us with this wonderful message of the gospel. But here is what I have done for you. And as John the Apostle writes, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us, prunes us from all sin. And as such, then, we're having both law and gospel in this section. Those who do not produce fruit, where there is not a living uh, faith, where there is no life in the branch, it gets cut off. And where the living branches are, they are pruned to be even more fruitful. And so Jesus then goes on in verse 4. Abide or remain or live in me and I in you. He is giving them a command. He is giving us a command to stay connected to him. To not allow the things of this world to so drive a wedge between us and our Redeemer that faith dies, that our fruitfulness in Christ dies, that people would look at us and couldn't even tell the difference between us who claim to be Christians and believers in Jesus from everybody else. There has to be something different. There has to be the life of Christ at work in us. And as such then, we are to seek to endeavor to remain in him or to abide in him. And how do we do that? But through the word that he has spoken to us and continues to speak to us. Through the supper in which his life continues to flow into our lives. Through, through repentance and trust in all that Christ has done for us and for our salvation. We abide in Christ, we remain connected to him as we remain connected to those things he gives that gives us life. If we isolate ourselves from those things, then of course the branch begins to become less fruitful and it may begin to wither and eventually it may die. Some of our brothers and sisters in Christ elsewhere in Christianity believe that if you are truly a Christian, you can never lose your salvation. Well, this is not what the scriptures declare. Christ never abandons us, but sadly, because of the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh, we often abandon Jesus. Thankfully for many, it's just a short abandonment. We, we cave into this temptation, give in to this sin, block ourselves off from our Savior, and then after, after it's been done or after we come to our senses, we're like the prodigal son coming back home to our father, hoping that somehow he'll accept, he'll accept this again, and the father in that, pro, in that parable comes running to his son and embraces him again. My son who was lost has been found. He who is dead is alive. And so here, you know, the the struggle that we have in this life, if we try to deal with it on our own, to say, I don't need God's word all the time. I don't need to be going to Holy Communion all the time. I don't need to go to church all the time, is to really be setting ourselves up for danger. And uh, it's the danger of incrementalism. That means bit by bit by bit. You know, termites getting into a house don't cause it to collapse in one day. They gotta eat away at the foundations. They gotta eat away at the timbers. And then eventually, under certain stresses, the house collapses. And so it is when faith is being attacked and isn't being repaired through God, through God's Holy Spirit and by his word, then those holes are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and the foundations of our faith are going to get weaker and weaker and weaker. And if we aren't staying connected to Christ, our whole house crumbles and we are lost. And our Lord takes this very, very seriously. And so he promises us that as we continue to cling to him, he will always abide or remain in us. He lives within us by the power of his Holy Spirit. His word is a part of our lives as we are connected to that word and use that word in us. And so he goes on in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. We are connected to him. Uh, his life flows to us. You know, a branch by itself does not produce fruit, does it? 
It has to be connected to the tree trunk or to the vine where the life of that, that trunk that pulls from the ground nutrients and water can then flow into the branches so that the branches then can produce this fruit. God, Christ isn't saying to us, I need you to do more stuff to prove that you're really connected to me. Because again, it's Christ at work in us where there is this living connection. If we're trying to do it on our own, we will most surely mess it up. And we're losing the whole point anyway if we're thinking it's somehow about, well, I got to do more stuff for Jesus if he's not going to send me off into the fire. It isn't about a works righteousness. It isn't about getting on that treadmill and running and running and running and running until somehow God is happy with us. It really, again, is that, and this is our Lord's point, is that this living connection to the life source is what we have to have if there is going to be a true fruitfulness in our lives, a spiritual fruitfulness. We can be very good people and do nice things to others without ever believing in Jesus as our Redeemer. I mean, that's just a fact of, of life. But those things that are pleasing in God's sight, that are spiritually beneficial, that show our connection to Jesus, that has to come from, again, this living connection to our, to our, to our vine, to our branch, to our trunk, Jesus. And so, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. You know, Paul describes the fruit of the Holy Spirit as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. The, fruit, the fruits of a living faith is active worship and prayer and receiving of his forgiveness and means of grace. It is desiring and praying for the well-being and welfare of others. It is, yes, even forgiving those who have sinned against us. These are all fruits of a living faith. Some are more developed in some of us, and others are more developed in others of us, but they are all fruits of a living and active faith. And Jesus says, for apart from me, you can do nothing. He, the writer of the Hebrews says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith in Christ, all the good works that we do in this world are beneficial perhaps to those in this world, but they are not something that God regards in the sense that they can earn us eternal life. Uh, Paul in, in uh, 1 Corinthians says, if I have uh, tongues of men and angels but have not love, I'm like a clanging gong or a resounding symbol. If I give all that I have to the poor but have not love, what have I gained? You know, the whole thing is here, the connection to faith in Christ. It is he who sanctifies, makes holy our lives. It is he who takes pleasure in his children who are living in this relationship of love and showing that in the things that they are doing. It is, it is, it is this fruitfulness that Christ is looking for, and apart from him, we're not going to do it. If anyone abides in me, uh, no, verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. And that was that thing that I had thought of when I studied this passage after having taken those branches out of my tree in the backyard. It's just a serious, serious business. Our Lord does not want any branch to be lost. This is why Christ came and hung on the tree of the cross and shed his blood for us. It is why in holy baptism, the Lord connects us to Jesus so that his life can flow into us and that we can grow as his Christians and, and have faith and trust in the forgiveness of our sins. But if we choose to isolate ourselves from those things, there may be a point where faith dies and there's no, nothing left then for God to do but to toss that dead branch into the fire. And that's not what he wants. And I think if we seriously take this to heart, that's not what we want. Certainly not for ourselves. And so this would spur us on to endeavor to say, Lord, 
Have mercy on me, forgive me, keep me connected to you. Let me desire to hunger for your word and, and let your life be lived out in my life so that they, people can see the fruit of my connection to you. And we don't want it for our children and grandchildren either, that they would be cut off and cast into the fire. And so maybe it's contingent on us as parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, whatever, to continue to pray for our wayward children, those who are moving away from the faith, those who perhaps have enmeshed themselves in some very bad things. We don't give up on them. God does not give up on us. He gave us his son. But we can pray for them. We can encourage them. We can still set an example for them, even with our failures and sins, because we can live out the forgiveness that Jesus has won for us. Our Lord says, abide in me, and I will abide in you. And even though a branch, earthly speaking, may have died, well, our Lord, he's the Lord of resurrection. He can always bring that dead branch back to life again and reconnect it to him. And that's what we hope for, that's what we pray for, that's what we desire. May God grant it for the sake of our Savior Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep each of your hearts and minds in true faith to life eternal, amen. We continue now with the prayer of the church. In our prayers this evening, we continue to pray for little Ronan Diebel, who is hospitalized, having been born prematurely. For those recovering from recent hospitalizations, Jean Ruprecht, Leona Warner, Barb Schultz, Bob Karg, and Beth Krug. And we give thanks to God for Fred and Kathy Karg as they celebrate their 53rd wedding anniversary. At the conclusion of our prayers, we continue then with the service of the sacrament. Let us rise for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have sought us out and have connected us to the true, to the true uh, vine, which is our Lord Jesus Christ. It is in him and his life flowing to us through word and sacrament that our lives are enriched and strengthened and that we are able to bear fruit in keeping with repentance and in keeping with the salvation that Christ has won for us. And yet we still do struggle with our fallen sinful nature and at times become apathetic or unfruitful. There are times where perhaps even we wander astray. Yet you continue to call us back to yourself, calling us to repentance and to trust again in the mercies of Christ. And we are thankful, O oh Lord, that in many cases there are those who have drifted away that have returned before it is too late. We pray for our fellow Christians, be they members of our own families, or members of our congregation that have drifted away from you. We pray that their faith has not yet completely died out, but that through whatever circumstances you would use, that you would help them to come to their senses and to realize their peril, and yet to also realize your gracious desire that they may have forgiveness in life through all eternity, and that you would draw them back to you. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would give us a greater determination to be involved in your word through hearing it preached, through studying it in Bible class, by reading it and having our devotions with it at home, that you would continue by your Holy Spirit to enrich our lives in the blessings of Christ. Be with little Ronan and his family as he remains hospitalized. We are thankful that he is getting stronger and growing uh, bigger every day. Bless the hospital staff and those who care for Ronan that in their vocations you would work uh, to bring about his full and complete uh, healing, that he would return home again. We commend Jean, Leona, Barb, Bob, and Beth to you as they are recuperating from various things. Help them, O Lord, and strengthen them day by day. And we rejoice together with Fred and Kathy as they celebrate their 53rd wedding anniversary. 
We thank you, dear Lord, for the blessings you've bestowed on them these many years and for the family that you have given to them. In this time of joy and celebration, continue to uphold and keep them in your love and mercy that they may ever give thanks to you. All of this we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. And most especially are we bound to praise you on this day for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, the very Paschal Lamb, who was sacrificed for us and bore the sins of the world. By his dying, he has destroyed death, and by his rising again, he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter and John, and with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
heart in peace. Amen.
Let us now rise for the canticle. Let us pray. O God the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Gentlemen. Hey, Karen. 